Erev Tov, everyone. If you open up a Sidor, a typical Sidor, and you turn to the back of the morning service, Shacharit, there's this uh, piyut, this poem called Anima Amin, and it's 13 articles of faith. It's actually based on a list that the Rambam compiled in his commentary on the Mishnah. And most of the things in there, we believe that, you know, there's one God, God created the universe, there's no other but God, nobody disputes any of those. But there are a couple in the middle that it's not that they're fundamentally opposed to Judaism, but the issue is this, the way these are presented is that either one believes these or they're a heretic, they fundamentally, you know, are outside of Judaism. So it's really important that when the, this list is put together, that it's something that we can essentially all agree upon. And this particular list, which again was not written by the Rambam, it was a popularized, simplified version. One of the things it says is the idea that the Torah that we have today is um, not only perfect, it's the exact same one, nothing has ever changed. And more importantly, all of the traditions we have from what our tefillin look like, like this is actually more in the Rambam, but what our tefillin look like, the way the sukkah look like. It's the exact same one that Moses was shown by God on Mount Sinai. Nothing has ever changed. It's the exact same one. We're still wearing the same fedora hats that Moses wore when he, you know, when he uh, was on Har Sinai. Now, this is not a heretical thing to say. That's just not true. And I'm not saying that the Torah is not a divine work that was given by Hashem on by, uh, to Moshe and Har Sinai, nor am I claiming that these things that tefillin and, and mezuzah are not traditions that are going back to ancient times and traced to the Torah, but a lot of the details about how we do it, what it looks like, have changed. And there's a lot of ways that we know that, partly because we have Jews today, we have Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazic Jews, Jews from Morocco, Jews from Libya, et cetera, who have slightly different translations. The very Torah scroll, like the, the thing that holds a Torah scroll is fundamentally different for Ashkenazim, which are on like these rolling sticks and Sephardim, it's this big, beautiful box that they hold differently. So we know there are different traditions. And the Rambam himself actually says that the only things he will codify as a mitzvah are things about which there is no debate. If there's a debate amongst the rabbis about the tradition, then he says, that's not the original tradition. Somehow what went back to Moshe has been lost. We're left with the debate. And then we just have to decide which one, you know, majority rules. But the takeaway is that we must recognize that even though we say everything is perfect and nothing has changed, things do change. But practically speaking, when a Jew wakes up in the morning and they go to kiss their mezuzah or they go to put on the tefillin, they don't usually have to open up 50 books or, or call their rabbi and say, which pair of tefillin? We have tefillin. I use the same tefillin that my father used and his father before him. We have clear traditions about what a mezuzah looks like, what a, a talis looks like, at least within different groups. But here's the thing. What if we were to discover some very incontrovertible evidence that the way that we've been putting our tefillin together, the shape, the color, is wrong. What do we do? If we find out that the way that we've been reading a particular line in the Torah is incorrect because we find the oldest Torah scroll in history that clearly states uh, you know, a different word or a different order or a different conjugation, inside of many printed Humashim Torah books, there are little notes on the side because there are words printed in the Torah scroll that we say, no, no, that was a mistake. We pronounce it this way. So why don't we just change what's in there? And the simple answer that we will get back to is because this is how we've always done it. So the question is, when we discover that the way we've always done it either might be wrong or is definitely wrong, do we change what we're doing? Or is the fact that we've done a certain practice or said a certain thing for so long, is that more important than what is true? So that's a big question about what is authentic, what is true, and what we're going to do tonight is explore this topic of discovering through archeology, span when we discover ancient objects or ancient texts that differ from what we have today, um, should that influence us today? Should that impact us? And first thing we'll do is we'll look at some of the three classic cases where that is explored. And then we're gonna look at basically two relatively contemporary rabbis that kind of become the representatives for the debate about whether or not discovery of new archeological evidence should affect Jewish law or practice. And then we'll look at a couple of examples of debates that are to this day happening. I myself 
struggled with one of them looking at archaeological historical evidence versus the predominant um, you know, tradition that has been going on for a thousand uh, years. And then I'll tell you where you could probably figure out where I fell out in the end just by looking at the, you, you'll, you'll know what I mean when we get there. But that's what we do. The first one is looking at the three classic examples and see what they seem to imply about whether or not discovering some archaeological evidence should influence Jewish law, then a couple of rabbis giving their take, and then again, we'll apply it or at least look at some of the common or modern debates about where this applies, because this is not only incredibly relevant and has been relevant, but it'll probably become more relevant as we discover new tools to be able to do better archaeology. We have only done a fraction of what is possible in discovering archaeological um, uh, finds. And unfortunately, a lot of what we can find is probably um, disintegrated at this point. One thing we'll also look at is a short piece that kind of gives us a state of archaeology today and why we should approach it with a grain of salt when trying to make fundamental statements about what is true and what is the actual uh, to fill in the correct one. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Tamar, this is the first source, which is actually really cool. Not necessarily that exciting, but it's the story of a rabbi who's basically led around by an Arab who's a native to the land of what would have then been Palestine. And he goes on a kind of archaeological dig discovering some ancient Jewish artifacts um, that might help him understand how to fulfill a particular mitzvah better, um, tzitzit. So Tamar Bavakasha and Rabbi Barbar Khanna said. And Rabbi Bar Rabbi Bar Barbar Khanna. Khanna, Bar Khanna, once we were traveling in the desert and we were accompanied by a certain Arab who would take dust and smell it and say, this is the road to such and such a place, and that is the road to such and such a place. We said to him, how far are we from the water? And he said to us, bring me dust. We brought, to him, we brought it to him, and he said, eight passed pas Parasangs, it's a certain, a certain distance. Passot. Later, we said this a second time and gave him dust. And he said to us that we are at a distance of three parasangs. I switched the type of dust to test him, but I could not confuse him. And he was an expert in this matter. That Arab said to me, come, I will show you the dead of the wilderness, i.e. the Jewish people who left Egypt and died in the wilderness. I went and saw them, and they had the appearance of one who is intoxicated, and they were lying on their backs, and the knees of one of them was elevated, and he was so enormous that the Arab entered under his knee while riding a camel, <laughs> while riding a camel with his spear upright, and he did not touch him. I cut one corner of the sky blue garment and contained ritual fringes of one of them. And we were unable to walk. The Arab said to me, perhaps you took something from them. Return it as we know by tradition that one who takes something from them cannot walk. I then returned the corner of the garment and then we were able to walk. So pause when there I... for a moment before before he concludes. So he's essentially grave robbing. And these are, you know, very old, you know, some sort of tomb. And these are the Jews who, uh, they weren't Jews at that point. They were the Israelites who were in the wilderness before they went to the land of Israel. So this is ancient. So it implies that they were wearing these tzitzit. And now a little bit of background information. When the Torah talks about the mitzvah of tzitzit, um, it's not talking about what we wear today. It's they would wear some sort of robed garment that had four corners. And on the corner of each, they would wear, you know, some sort of tzitzit, which the Torah, uh, it's not an easily translatable word, but it also says that one of the strings of it, so we know there's strings, needs to be this color of techele, which is a kind of bluish purple. That's a debate we'll come back to regardless. He knew from this Arab who clearly was an expert in his field, or at least convinced him he was an expert, that this was truly ancient. This is one of, if not the oldest pair of tzitzit in the entire world. And he thought, oh my gosh, if I could get a sample of this, 
I could show it to everybody else and we could start making our tzitzit like the Israelites who wandered in the Midbar. Wouldn't that be incredible and authentic? Now it gets into a little bit of you know magical curse here that he cuts off a corner and they're unable to travel. And the Arab says, look, you, you steal from a grave, you're cursed. So he puts it back. But now he wants to rush home and tell his fellow rabbis, you know, guess what I found? So it continues, um, when I came before the sages. When I came before the sages, they said to me in rebuke, every Abba is a donkey and every Barbar Hana is an idiot. For the purpose of clarifying, what halacha did you do there? If you wanted to know whether the halacha is in accordance with the opinion of Beit Shammai or in accordance with opinion of Beit Hillel, as to whether there are four or three threads and joined in ritual fringes, in that case, there was no need to take anything with you, as you should have simply counted the threads and counted the joints. So they're saying here that what he hoped to do is there was a fundamental um, debate between these two academies, a Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai about a detail of the tzitzit and which was the actual mitzvah. And he found the, uh, a pair of tzitzit that was old as possible. Mm -hmm. And whatever it looked like, that's how you would resolve the debate. And he said, guys, I found this incredible thing that would resolve the debate. What did it look like? Well, I, I don't know, I was gonna bring it to you. Why didn't you just count? and you know, make a mark in your hand or just remember what it looked like, take a picture as it were. So it's a lot of rabbis actually debate this in two ways. One say that they rebuke them and say, you're an idiot. We don't, you know, you're making this story up. Archeology span is nonsense, which doesn't seem to be what they're saying here. It seems like they're saying you idiot. If you really wanted to know the halakha, why didn't you just pay attention to it? And just tell us we would have trusted you. But now that you're clearly making these stupid decisions, you know, you've basically gained nothing by it. But the implication from the text here, and Lynn, I do see your hand, uh, and then I'll unmute you for the next source, seems to be that if he had, possibly, if he had said, oh, it's three or four, they would have said, well, that resolves the debate there, implying that archaeological, even if the story is a little wild and magical, maybe archaeology can help some debates. Lynn, yes. You just have to unmute on your side. And then uh, stay on mute and I'll have you read the next uh, little story. Okay. What bothers me about this, aside from the fantastical aspect of it, but it does, he doesn't say what he found to be so remarkable, but there's one element that you mentioned that he may have seen and how can you show evidence of color? What if he had seen what is the true trelet? How can you go back to your compatriots and say, I saw the perfect blue, but I couldn't bring it to you because when I cut it off, I couldn't move. So one of the things that it's unclear, maybe that's what you're getting on is what did he want to show them? Was it about this debate of Hillel and Shammai about, and that might be what they're saying. You know, if you wanted to just tell us if it's three or four strings, you should have counted three or four and then just told us. But unless you actually have the thing in your hand, the physical, you know, actual object, this doesn't help us. Now, the response to that could be, had he brought it, they would have been like, oh, this resolves the debate. And that's what the, the, the rest of this class was going to look at rabbis about when they did find something concrete, how did they deal with it? So it's not entirely clear here why they were so angry at him. Were they angry because they said, you had a great opportunity to help resolve a great debate, or you're wasting our time, um, either because you didn't bring anything, or we don't really care about stuff like this. Don't tell us your fantastic stories. You know, if we said, I found the Ark of the Covenant. Well, where is it? Well, it disappeared magically. So it's not entirely clear, but this is one of the classical sources that people hold up. And that's important. How is this used? This is used as proof that archaeological evidence could help resolve debates. Now, that's not fundamentally changing Jewish law. That's when we have two opinions and it's not clear which is the correct one. Um, although at this point, the rabbis did have to rule that we go by, generally we'll hold by, by Beit Hillel uh, or Hillel in most cases. And if that's the practice they've had for even a hundred years at this point, would they change it based on a single thread that somebody said they found in the desert, especially before carbon dating? Um, but we're not done with those questions. So the next source here is in some ways it's a commentary on the Talmud, but it's essentially uh, a uh, a rabbi who goes through all of the mitzvot and you know commentary and explaining them, known as the smag, the Sefer Mitzvot Gedolot, 
Rabbi Moshe ben Yaakov of Kusi. And the, the context here um, is that with the tefillin, there's two different tr traditions about, so inside the tefillin box, there are a couple of different parchments that have the text that describe wearing tefillin. And there's a debate about what order those scrolls are put in. There's on one side, you have Rashi and Rambam Maimonides, which is what we follow. And the other side, you have uh, Rabbeinu Tam, who's a grandson of Rashi. But we don't really you know, have any evidence which is right other than logical proofs and which one became popular. So the smog talks about this experience that he had. Uh, go ahead, Lynn. In case, in any case, our custom in the lands of Edom and Yishmael is according to the words of Rashi and the Rambam. So he's probably talking about the Middle East. If he's talking about Edom is like where ancient Rome would have been and Palestine, basically the Middle East is to fold, hold by the tradition of Rashi and Rambam, which is again, basically what we do today. Go ahead. They also sent the letter from the land of Israel where they discovered a very ancient pair of tefillin by the grave of Yechezkel that was ordered according to Rambam and Rashi. Uh, that, so that's the end of it. I mean, he, this is from a much longer piece. Now, this thing that he discovered essentially holds up the tradition as people were doing it anyways. But what's important here is, again, people point to this and say that the smog is emphasizing that the correct version of the tefillin are according to Rashi and Rambam. Why? Because we found an ancient pair of tefillin that was near the, the, the grave of the prophet Yechezkel. And because I found the single pair of tefillin that looks like this, therefore, that is the tradition we should follow. But Lynn, asking you there, what's the, uh, not logical, but what's the issue with basing something off of finding a single pair of tefillin? It's only? One, but yeah, it's only one. That's a it's a very big critique of really all of these things, and we'll it will come back to it later in the class. Is if you found in ancient Israel thousands of pairs of tefillin that were one way, slightly different from today, be a very different story. But he claims to have found one pair of tefillin that were clearly quite old. And by the way, this doesn't mean that this is incorrect. It might be that the earliest ever pairs of tefillin were according to what Rashi and Rambam ruled. But again, he's saying here that all the evidence he needed was a single pair um, near the grave of Yechezkel, which does not mean that it was as old as Yechezkel. Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Well, there's a bunch of questions bouncing around in my head, and I'm not going to go back to the prior source, even though I've got questions on it. Did, do we know for sure where Yechezkel is buried? Did they know? Did I, the... I, I don't think so. Yeah, there's making a lot of archaeological assumptions here. And and we'll come back to some of that stuff is um, archaeologists might say, well, the, the law is based on this town being in X spot, but we found that it's in Y spot. And the rabbi comes along and proves them wrong. And everybody's going back and forth and uh, assumptions and stuff like that. So archaeology, which we'll read more about it as a current science, is a brilliant thing. And we discover a great deal about our past, but it's also constantly changing. And there are a lot of things that we could be incorrect about. Um, so we're going to come back to that question. So that, that question will be validated again. Because this seems to imply, I, we knew that it was Yechezkel and he's a big deal. And if they were by him, then that's good enough for me. So that's because what they must have been connected to him. So one is good yeah. enough because he's my source. So that's, so that's essentially, it seems to be what the smog is saying. And that's, and that's, again, why this is one of the three main classical sources pointed to as holding up archaeology. Here he discovers presumably an archaeological source, which, as we just pointed out, can easily be you know, questioned deeply. But that's almost not the point here. The point here is that the Talmud implies that archaeological evidence might be a factor. The smog argues uh, here that archaeological evidence might be a factor. So it almost doesn't matter if their facts are, I mean, it does matter if their facts are right, but that's almost not our main point. The point here is now we have a second source that clearly implies that archaeology can be used to either confirm or potentially question um, our practice. And then the, the third source, and Lynn, I'll let you take this because it's so crazy short. So the context here is um, the shekel, the coin, uh, which in the Torah was used as essentially tax. And you know, there was a half shekel coin given to help support the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, and, there were, there were, and to take a census, a lot of things that were relevant to it. Well, later in times, we don't have a beta migdash. However, there are certain commandments where knowing the weight of a shekel is important. Um, if a firstborn male is born, 
he needs to be redeemed to a priest, a Kohen, and he needs to use a silver coin that's equivalent to the weight of the shekel. Fine. How much did a shekel weigh? So there are debates about amongst the rabbis about how much a shekel weight, and there's, you know, they go back and forth in the Ramban, you can look at the source inside, brings all the different opinions, Rashi and everything like that, about how much it's weighed, et cetera, like that. But there's a comment that was not actually in all uh, printings, it was only in the manuscript. And the Ramban talks about this experience where he made Aliyah to Israel, and he had held a certain opinion about the weight of the shekel coin, which means that in certain mitzvot, he would have ruled that, you know, X weight, is enough. But then this happened. Go ahead, Lynn, source number three. Okay, from the Ramban Shmot, weighing his options. When the Ramban made Aliyah, he was shown a coin by the local Samaritans, and it, the coin, was an ancient Hebrew script, which was still used by the Samaritans, just as was mentioned in the Talmud in Sanhedrin. And on one, it said, shekel of the shekels. And on the second side, it said, Holy Jerusalem. So what he he had, I don't, I, I didn't bring the whole source here, so I don't remember exactly whatever source he held by and said, according to this rabbi, that's the weight of a shekel. Then he went to Israel and the local people, the Samaritans, who have a historical connection with the Jews. They have at time been friends and they have at time been not necessarily adversaries per se, but at least theological adversaries and their claims of the Torah. And their Torah was actually in that ancient Hebrew script. And they showed him this coin that was certainly quite old, was written in the ancient Hebrew script. We had our class on the development of the Hebrew language. And it looked like a shekel that went back about as old as you could possibly get. And he weighed it. And based on the weight of it, he changed his opinion. Meaning the way he ruled on Jewish law fundamentally changed after he weighed. How many coins did he weigh, Lynn? One, he weighed one coin. The other critique here is who showed this to him. And this is a little... Um, uh, you know, a, a sort of an attack, as it were, um, the Samaritans. A lot of rabbis say, you can't trust the Samaritans. So that's, you know, sort of an unkind thing there. But they say, look, we only had one sample size. We don't necessarily trust the people who showed it. They might have some ulterior motive in there. But regardless, the takeaway point here is Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, one of the greatest rabbis, um, both in terms of his commentary on the Torah and his legal writings, changed a halachic ruling based on finding archaeological evidence and doing his own scientific work. So all three of these sources have implied that if we discover you, and again, mostly it's not about text, it's mostly about physical objects, but if we find something that shows that the objects or the weight or the way we've understand how to build something is incorrect, we change our opinion when we discover something that seems to be older and potentially more correct. So before we go on to the next source, are there any questions? Up until now. No pause. Yeah, Rabbi, yeah, Ken, please with, go ahead. With both the the, the film and, and this weight over here, um, the, it, this wasn't like, oh, we're going to do it, uh, this mitzvah for the first time. The, they were putting the film in on Rashi and Rambam, you know, till then. So did it did what they found? Did it agree with what they found? Did the same thing with so, the shekel? So in that so in that case, it essentially affirmed, I believe, what they were they were doing anyway. So it wasn't really a big issue there. It was you know it's like when the rabbis say like I believe in the exodus from from Egypt, and I just found evidence uh, that it was true. So here it didn't necessarily change it. The point of the smog really is more that he took uh, you know if he had found a different version, he implies that he might have changed his opinion, but that archaeological evidence is an important factor in halakha. So the smog there is more like, it's exciting when we find something that confirms what we're doing, but Ramban, who's certainly more well-known, is clearly saying, and that's maybe why it's not put in all versions of the commentary. It's left out of a lot, um, but it's in all pretty much all handwritten manuscripts. He clearly wrote it, is that if we find evidence, physical archeological evidence that disagrees with what we've been doing, then we should change it. And we have a lot of things like how much matzah we eat. We say we eat as much as uh, you know, an egg's worth or something like that at Kibetza. And we rule, we rule that it's, you know, it's this much weight or this much volume based on all these other factors. Well, if we could go back in time and find an ancient fossilized egg that was clearly carbon dated to the times of the ancient rabbis, and it was half as much as we believe or twice as much, do we change how much matzah we have to eat or need to eat, et cetera? 
And these three sources seem to be implying that maybe. Now, before we go on to rabbis actually making more contemporary rabbis actually ruling what we should do and how we should or should not weigh this evidence, we're going to take a brief uh, detour and look at the state of modern archaeology and why we should still take it with a grain of salt. Again, if we found 10,000 pairs of tefillin that were all the exact same in ancient Israel um, and they all disagreed with what we did today, that's one thing. That might be a conspiracy, but that's generally not what we find. So um, let's see, we got, where's Elizabeth go? Did Elizabeth disappear? Oh no. Okay, Ken, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. And Ken, this is from Rabbi Chaim Jachter who wrote an incredible article about this whole topic. Uh, and, and I took a lot of guidance um, uh, from his work to be able to track down a lot of these sources. Um, but he also wrote a really nice, uh, in his piece, uh, kind of, again, a summary of what archeology span kind of looks like today. Um, and what's interesting, it's a very scientific process. And he's also implying that the development of Jewish law and when it should change should also take it scientifically and with you know, a grain of salt. So uh, Ken, go ahead, the study of archeology. span Sure, just one comment, you, you know, the, the 10,000 pairs of tefillin or, or, or whatever you had could have been, you know, rejects of the coin could have been counterfeit. You have no way of knowing it out of context. So, all right, the study of archeology span has advanced very significantly, significantly in the past hundred years. Each succeeding generation has introduced new methodologies with more accurate exploration and assessment of the past. Today, computers and science are standard tools in archeologists ever expanding arsenal of exploratory techniques. Archeology span is often questioning and challenging its own findings as it develops as a field. Archeology span as a discipline is constantly evolving. Since the early 1900s, each succeeding generation identified the limitations of the previous methodology and techniques employed. Accordingly, while we may admire the achievements of archeologists, we must at the same time be aware of and recognize the limitations regarding their conclusions. There are other significant limitations that we must bear in mind when assessing the value of archeological findings. First is that there is an inherent limitation in the survival of most artifacts due to deterioration that occurs over time in the item from use and exposure to the environment. Organic items such as food, papyrus, and animal skins do not survive for long, for, uh, for long periods of time. Even metal and stone objects also do not survive in the original form. Most studies were meant to be used. They were not created with the idea that they would endure forever. And as such, only a small percentage of the entire corpus of material actually survives. Second, only tiny percentages of areas of interest have been ex ex excavated. The reasons for this include costs and the wish to allow future archaeologists to test these theories and met methodologies for a site. Hence, it is wrong to draw con broad conclusions based on documents or artifacts that have not been found in arche ar archaeological excavations. Third, ancient histories that have been unearthed often include bald lies and exaggerations. I could think of a president that said he won. Ancient kings would often employ individuals to record history in a manner that would most be, be most flattering to the king rather than in the most objective manner. Fourth, an integral component of archeological uh, uh, studies is the interpretation of the materials that have been in earth, unearthed. Interpretation is by definition subjective. In the archeological archeologists, Archaeologists, political or religious beliefs often color and biases theories and conclusions. Thus, one must employ archaeology in the services of Torah in a very selective and critical manner. Excellent. So, I mean, we could, we're going to look at some other uh, rabbinic opinions here, but Rabbi Jachter said it quite beautifully. And there's a couple of important things to note here. Uh, one is that let's say there were 5,000 pairs of tefillin and 4,999 of them just deteriorated because that's what happened with most things from the ancient past. How do we know that the one pair that we found, as you said beautifully, Ken, wasn't the reject? Maybe it was one that wasn't kosher and it just happened to survive. 
you need a much bigger sample size. And unfortunately, most things are either they just don't exist anymore, or we just haven't discovered them. Archaeology is a science and it is developed and grown, and it's an amazing science and we should cultivate it and keep getting better. However, part of science is that as it gets better, it often changes. Now, that doesn't mean science is wrong or science is bad. That's actually the best thing about science is it constantly is improving, which is why we should give it so much support and listen to the conclusions. However, if an archaeologist says this is end of story, that's often not true. Maybe it is, but it's, uh, it's more likely that it's part of the story and they've discovered a hint at something, but to make fundamental decisions or assumptions about the history of mankind or certainly the history of a particular mitzvah or Jewish object or artifact um, is not entirely reasonable because there's so many unknowns included um, in it. And also an archeologist, you know, they may misinterpret something. Uh, and also the history that was left behind. If somebody left the description of something, how do we know that they left an accurate description of something? Maybe they purposely misrepresented what happened historically. So to trust things that we find buried in the sand, to learn from things that we find buried in the sand is well worth it, should continue to do that. To base fundamental decisions about how we live our lives and how we understand the world based on things we find buried in the sand, we should take that with a grain of sand or salt as it were. <laughs> so having put that in mind, now we're gonna look at, again, probably, or I'll, I'll pause here for a moment. Are there any questions up until now? Excellent. Leon, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. You just have to tap on uh, your side. And excellent. So these are, um, and I'll let you take both because the first one's so short, Leon. These again are representative of, it's not really two sides of the debate because these two rabbis sort of agree, but the second one adds a very important nuance to essentially, should we ever take archaeological evidence into consideration. If we find something that disagrees that the way that we've been doing something with the way that we've been practicing a holiday with what our you know, lulav and etrog, the Torah does not tell us what plants to use in the lulav. It does not say a, a palm tree or, or palm fronds. It does not say, um, you know, that etrog, that citrus fruit. That's based off rabbinic interpretation. What if we find evidence, DNA evidence, that the uh, lulav they were using in the times of the temple was different. Do we all start buying a different lulav today? So the first opinion is that of a rabbi known as the Chazon Ish, a rabbi uh, Avram Yesheu Karlitz, 20th century Belarus. So relatively recent. So he makes actually a fairly pretty big blanket statement about what he feels about archeology. span So Leon, go ahead and source number one. All right, from the Chazon Ish. Can you hear me, first of all? Yes, absolutely, okay. you're good. I am not acquainted with the endeavor of excavations and, the, and studies of antiquities, and I oppose this enterprise because of the many uncertainties involved. Thank you. Now, it's interesting here because he says, I don't really know about it. So what should he do? He should learn about it and find, study the science and see how it's ever growing. But his second point is one that we can you know, agree with and understand, which is there are a lot of uncertainties. Now, he doesn't just say because of the uncertainties, we should take it, you know, be very careful and cautious. He just writes it off completely. And now he and other works kind of develops this idea a little bit more. And one of them, as we'll come back to later, is, you know, this is the tradition that's been passed down. But the other thing he says is, look, the reason that we have the tefillin we have today, and we don't have the tefillin that's buried in the sand, or the tefillin that's buried in the sand, if that was the correct tefillin, God would not have let it be forgotten. If God wanted that to be the tefillin, so this it's more of a theological debate than a historical one about the realities of, of, of exile and of uprooting and what happens to a society. They can't control what they can take with them. But for the Chazan Ish, the reason those tefillin were buried in the sand is because they were not as important. They were not the authentic tefillin that were meant to be passed down. The lulav we have today, the mezuzot that we have today, the reason we have them is because God wanted them to be the ones we have. Again, that's not a scientific academic argument, which is fine. He doesn't need to make a scientific argument. He's talking about theological things, but that's his opinion. He essentially writes it off completely as do many who agree with the Chazanish. But Leon, the second source is from um, Rav Kook, who was the first rabbi of 
British Mandate Palestine, who was a deeply religious man, but he also very much embraced and engaged with and respected modern, uh, you know, modernity and the modern world and recognized there was a lot of value in it. So what he's talking about here is that on Purim, um, the day on which we celebrate Purim depends on um, where the, basically go back historically, there was uh, Purim in the town of Shushan, and that's when the miracle was, and they conquered and destroyed all of the, the mercenaries there. But then the proclamation and the fighting continued outside of Shushan into the next day. So if you were in a walled city like Shushan, you do it on you know, the first day of Purim. And if you are outside of the land, you do it on the, the next day, which is when most people do it. So what we want to do is figure out what cities had walls around them in the time when Purim happened. Jerusalem was a walled city. So they do it on a different day than Milwaukee. But what if we found out that Milwaukee had been a walled city in the times of Purim? So go ahead, I mean, not Milwaukee, he's talking about ancient cities in Israel, but what if we find archeological evidence from a city that has Purim on a different day than Jerusalem, we found out that it used to have a wall. Should we change the day that they celebrate Purim? That's a pretty big deal. So go ahead, Leon. Regarding the issue of establishing the reading of the Megillah in a certain locale on the 15th of Adar, I do not find that the evidence you have sent me is sufficient to establish these places as having been surrounded by walls during the period of Joshua. Mm -hmm. So sorry, not in the times of Purim, but going all the way back to when Yehoshua, yeah. when Joshua went into the land of Israel. And by the way, he got an actual question. Someone said, here's a town, and when we do Purim on a different day, and we have some evidence that it used to be walled going all the way back to Yehoshua. So they sent in the evidence. Go ahead. The evidence does not even rise to the level of doubt since it, since it must overcome the Rambam's observation that the Rov majority of cities of the world were not surrounded by walls during the time of Joshua. So this is something that um, I don't remember the legal term for it, but again, uh, what Rambam said is that vast majority of cities did not have walls around them. So there's a great burden of, of proof here. Like you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, like with exceptional amounts of evidence that it had a wall, because generally we know that most cities didn't have walls. So you can't just show me that maybe possibly it had a wall because we assume it probably didn't. You need to show overwhelming evidence that it had a wall. Please continue. This entire enterprise of quote, Eretz Yisrael scholarship, unquote, is filled with guesswork. All Excuse me. <clears throat> Although this endeavor is worthy of respect and warm admiration for the scholars involved in this study, due to our love of holy Torah matters, nonetheless, one cannot make halachic decisions based on the Arab names of a specific area. Nevertheless, if you have any fundamentally different proofs or sources, kindly inform me of them. And believe that there, I will express my views on this matter. Excellent. So he's hinting there at some of the evidence as, oh, we misidentified this place. And based on the Arab name for it, we know it actually probably did have a wall, et cetera, like that. So it's not even concrete evidence, literally concrete um, evidence. But what's really important is not that he rejects this particular case and says, based on your archaeological findings, uh, we're not going to change the ruling of when you read the Megillah. But what he says is, archaeology is awesome because what it allows us to do is to understand the Torah better. And any tool we can use, we, we love the Torah. We wanna to be able to understand it. We wanna be able to live it and, and, and you know, have an authentic version of it. So this is another tool we can use to enhance the Torah, even if it changes what we think we understood. And if you indeed find more concrete, stronger evidence, I will absolutely revisit my views. So those are the two things he said, archeology span is awesome. And if we get, to a, a certain amount of a certain amount of evidence, then maybe we will change the law in certain cases. So that's extremely important. So he actually does not agree with the Chazanish. The Chazanish says, no, there's too many doubts. Rav Cook says, look, if there's a lot of doubts, don't change the law. But if you get pretty certain uh, about something historically, then maybe the law should change. We should change our mezuzahs. We should change our tefillin. We should change the sidur. And we actually have things like this all the time. We find a manuscript version of something in the sidur 
And in fact, we find different Cedarim. There's the publishers, corn publishers, that absolutely will change the text and say, no, 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 this is the older manuscript version. And Art Scroll's like, no, this is the one we've used for 50 years. And 50 years is there was never, there were no Jews more than 50 years ago. And Cord says, that's cool. We have 50 copies that are over 300 years old. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but something like that. So this debate not only is alive and constant, but people do indeed make changes. Now, a manuscript change to a word or a letter in a sidur is not quite as, as heavy or weighty or serious as you know, an, a mitzvah, you know, a commandment about tefillin or lulav or mezuzah, et cetera, like that. But it is indicative of the fact that we do indeed take archeological manuscript evidence into consideration. And if there's really good evidence, there are plenty of rabbis who say we should consider changing it. And there are rabbis who say, it doesn't matter. This is how we've always done it. So before we go on to some contemporary examples of this and how the rabbis have approached it today, which is archeology span is great. And if there's enough evidence, we should absolutely reconsider um, our, our rulings. Beautiful. So the last section here is not really a big one to read is I did a little bit of research. And again, I gratitude to Rabbi Jachter, who's a, a rabbi teaches in, he's a prolific author, builds Eruvs, um, and also uh, teaches at a, at a yeshiva high school, brilliant guy. Uh, so based on his research, I did these kind of summaries about two modern debates based on archaeological evidence. So one of them we kind of already touched on, which is thing to it. So I'm going to see if I can pull this up without pulling my shirt off. But so these are my tzitzit, and you can see they're all the color white. But when the Torah talks about tzitzit, it says that there should be a blue string in them, blue, you know, like the, the rabbis say, like the color of the sky, but the Torah doesn't define exactly what blue. Is it uh, light blue, dark blue? Is it more of a purple? There's a lot of evidence to show that. Now, what we do have in the Talmud is a rabbi that says that in his day, he had people, he wore this blue string. And he knew that the dye for it was from a particular snail that he used. There's a typo here. It's not chilzon, it's chilazon. And they would make the dye from that particular um, sea snail. Great. They fulfilled the mitzvah. Everyone agreed it was kosher. They used the chilazon. But then the chilazon either disappeared or nobody knew what it was anymore when we left the land. So people said, well, we're not really sure what color the chilazon should be anymore. So should we use an incorrect color of it? Or should we just stop doing the blue string because we don't want to do a mitzvah incorrectly? Better to not do it than to do it wrong. So it became the custom, and it's still the mainstream custom today, is just not to use a blue string because we're not sure how to do that part of the mitzvah correctly. The rest of it, the rest of the strings, we're happy. We, have our, we actually have differing traditions as that first source showed out about how many strings to tie, et cetera, but people are generally happy with it. But then came along a rabbi within the last century, and he discovered a snail that checked off all the boxes that matched the chilazon, and that snail was called the murex trunculus. And it, uh, and, it, and it fit everything. And he said, this is clearly the chilazon of the Talmud. And he started making techelet. And there were Jews, particularly in Israel, who started to wear that blue string. So the question was, well, we have, now we have archeological scientific evidence, we've discovered it. So let's start going back to an original custom that we used to have, it's, but essentially changing what we've been doing for generations. So how did people respond to it? Some people adopted it. And when that first came out, I was one of the people who considered putting on Tehillit. And the reason I don't is I essentially decided to go with the majority. But one of the great rabbis of Israel who passed away a number of years ago, Rav El Yashiv, somewhat recently, he said, look, this rabbi is 100% sure that he discovered the, you know, the, the correct snail. But then in the generation after him, someone's going to come along and say it's 100% sure that he was wrong. And the next generation, someone's going to come back and say he's 100% sure that he's wrong. Every, and this is, again, the scientific method, which is awesome. That's how science gets better. But Rav Yashev says, fine, science should constantly be updating vaccines and medicine and medical procedures. It is a life and death thing. It should absolutely constantly change as new evidence comes into play. But halacha should not be that wishy-washy because what will happen is every time we discover a new dye, we're gonna constantly be throwing out our old seat seat and bringing in new ones. 
And we just can't do that because we're just, again, we're going to be constantly throwing out the previous generation and it's going to become a mess. Now, this doesn't say that we should never change Jewish law. It's just that if every time a rabbi comes out and says, I found the correct pair of tefillin, everybody throw out your tefillin and buy a new pair for $1,000, it's not feasible. But then Rav Schachter, Rav Schachter is a contemporary rabbi uh, in New York, he comes along and takes that same argument about each generation um, disproving the previous generation and says, no, yes, it's the scientific method, but we shouldn't reject and never make changes because they keep uh, undermining each other. Every generation builds on the previous generation. So this next rabbi came in and said, no, 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 your snail is wrong. So it's actually this snail. But I never would have known that if not for you, what you discovered. So every generation is actually learning a little bit from the next generation. So we should actually take every generation into consideration because they're not just constantly back and forth. You're wrong, I'm right. You're wrong, I'm right. They're rather saying, oh, you made this discovery. I don't think you're correct, but because of you, I made a slightly better discovery and a slightly better one. It's still kind of the scientific method, but his point is that as rabbis keep disproving each other, it's actually, be, it means they're becoming wiser and wiser, learning more and more, and we should consider their opinions. Any questions on the Tichelet before we look at the second example? Yeah, Ken, please. Um, yeah, but though you may um, build on it, does, does that necessarily mean that you have to implement it? In other words, some people in Israel now may have, or, or not necessarily in Israel, uh, I think even I've seen blue in our temple. May, it, yeah, uh, you, you, I mean, it's pretty, it's not super widespread, but it's it's out there. Okay, so that doesn't say it's right, but it doesn't say it's wrong. So it's like, could you have this and that as a living Torah? And um, in other words, if someone went according to, you know, to the Murex trunculus. Yeah. And did the tzitzis at it, would that make their tzitzis? Are we getting to a point where people are going to say, oh, no, that's wrong? Your, your tzitzis aren't kosher? Or... Okay, you, so I mean, is, is it a black and white kind of choice? So that becomes the issue is people say, unless you're 100% certain, don't do it, um, or it might not be kosher at all. And there's some rabbis who say, you know, it's we're never going to be 100% certain. So it's enough to be 60% certain, to have a reasonable doubt that we might consider changing law. And that's where the, the debate kind of sits in there. And that's the Rav El Yashiv versus Rav Shachta. Rav El Yashiv says, you know, if we're never 100% sure, because rabbis keep overturning, just don't do it. Because we can all agree it's better to not do it than to take a risk. And Rav Shachter, and I'm not saying Rav Shachter is ruling one way or another on Tehillah, I don't believe he wears them. But what he's saying is no, each generation is actually um, raising the, by, by overturning the previous generation, they're shrinking the doubt. They're doing more scientific experiments to kind of, you know, close in the gap on what might the 100% correct answer actually be. So the previous generation, they were wrong with being 51% sure. And the next generation might be wrong, but they were 60% sure. And the next generation might turn out to be wrong, but they were 70% sure. And the point is, is that many rabbis are arguing 70% is not 100, but it's enough that perhaps we should consider changing our practice. But one of the big things that we haven't talked about now is fine, you know, if there's a debate about something and how we do it, 70% might be enough. But what if we've been doing something for a thousand years? Are you really going to change it based on 65%? So that leads to mezuzot. All Ashkenazi Jews, their mezuzah is at an angle. And the reason for that is going back to a debate in the Talmud, about how the original mezuzot were. Were they vertical or were they horizontal? And in fact, you see this reflected <coughs> in the way that um, Torah scrolls are read. Us Ashkenazi Jews, we lay our mezuzah, our mezuzah, our Torah scroll basically flat. It's a slight angle, but it's basically flat. Whereas Sephardic Jews, their Torah scroll, which is a big open chest, is completely vertical. And that's represented in the Sephardic mezuzahs. If you go to the house of a Sephardic Jew, and according to the opinion of Rashi, who was an Ashkenazi, which is so interesting, their mezuzahs are straight up and down. That's their tradition. Well, apparently there was found a very ancient mezuzah that was indeed vertical, like Rashi and the Sfaradim. 
well, if that's the oldest authentic version, then shouldn't we all change our, shouldn't we all go to our, our, our front doors right now, take out a mezuzah, make sure it's perfectly straight, use a plumb line and stick it back in. And the challenge there is one that we've already seen, which is how many of these mezuzahs that they found in this particular shape is one. That is not enough of a sample size because maybe if they keep digging, they'll find a hundred that are uh, horizontal or they might find some that are indeed at an angle. The other question here is with mezuzahs, we've had a tradition, Ashkenazi Jews, for thousands of years how to do it. This is not something that we've been debating back and forth and nobody's really sure what the ruling is. We have a set tradition here. So a lot of these rabbis say their thing is, look, if there's something that people are constantly arguing about, whether, whether glass or china can be made kosher, and we find some archaeological evidence or some textual proof that shows that it can or cannot, that might settle the debate. But things that we've been doing for thousands of years, even if you bring some pretty decent evidence, that's not enough to change an ancient tradition. You need to have a massive sample size. And that's what I said the conclusion here is, if someone has a massive sample size, like 50 scrolls of Torah that are different than the ones we have today, um, and there's some debate about what it is, then the answer is, do we change what we do? Maybe. So the reality is, going back to the original question, could or should archaeology have an influence on Jewish law, on text? The answer is yes, but the threshold for when that happened, or maybe, but the threshold for that is incredibly high. But there are certain Jews that their threshold is lower, and they wear the blue fringe. And there are certain Jews who their threshold is very, very high, and it's going to take a lot for them to change their practice. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Again, we have a tradition. We, there's a small sample size. How do we know that what you found is indeed the authentic one? So the archaeological debate, as the science gets better and we discover more things, it's entirely possible that things that we've taken as fact, as sacrosanct, this is what tefillin look like. This is the way mezuzot are. It may indeed change but it's gonna take a lot of evidence and a lot of archeological digging for that to happen. But the really cool takeaway is that the development of Jewish law is very much alive. And our understanding of what have been, has been passed down can indeed change. It is a living tradition and we do indeed learn from the past. We just need to be certain about what we are learning.